Thank you. That concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Nicola Sturgeon on COVID-19 update. The First Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Before turning to COVID today, and with your permission, I'd like to give a very brief update on our efforts to welcome refugees from Ukraine. Uh, the response of the public across the UK in offering support has been truly outstanding, and I want to thank everyone who has volunteered. Under the UK scheme, though, with the exception of people who already know someone seeking refuge, it may be some time before most of those offering help will be able to actually welcome someone from Ukraine. The Scottish Government's super sponsor proposal is intended to short circuit this and allow Ukrainians to get here and be safeguarded and supported more quickly. I am therefore pleased to advise that the UK Government has now indicated support for this proposal in principle and has committed to working with us towards its immediate launch alongside the wider UK scheme. This is a positive development and I hope, assuming we can agree the details, that as a start it will allow Scotland to welcome 3,000 Ukrainians to Scotland very soon. I will update Parliament more fully on these matters tomorrow. Uh, presiding officer, turning now to COVID, I will confirm Cabinet's decisions on lifting the limited measures that remain in law and set out our intentions for the testing programme. Uh, firstly, though, a brief overview of the state of the pandemic. Public Health Scotland has had server problems over the past 24 hours, so no daily figures were published yesterday, and of course figures are no longer published at weekends. The case number being reported today, therefore, 38,770, is a cumulative total for the past four days. For context, the total for the equivalent four-day period last week was 36,051. These figures reflect the recent increase in cases. The ONS survey suggests that in the week to 6 March, one in 18 people in Scotland had COVID. Three weeks ago, an average of 6,900 new cases a day were being reported. The average now is just over 12,000 a day. There has also been a rise in the number of people who are in hospital with COVID. Three weeks ago, that stood at 1,060. Today, it is 1,996. The increase in cases over the past three weeks has been driven by the BA2 sub-lineage of the Omicron variant, which is estimated to be significantly more transmissible, with a growth rate since mid-February perhaps 80 per cent greater than original Omicron. BA2 is now in Scotland our dominant strain, accounting for more than 80 per cent of all reported cases. BA2 has become dominant in Scotland earlier than in England and Wales, hence the more rapid increase in cases here uh, than south of the border in recent weeks, although cases and hospital admissions are now rising sharply again in England too. Encouragingly, there is no evidence that BA2 causes more severe illness than BA1 or that it is more effective at evading natural or vaccine immunity. Indeed, immune protection means that the recent rise in cases and hospital admissions has not translated into a commensurate increase in cases of severe illness requiring intensive care. In other words, even though weight of numbers of infections is putting significant pressure on hospital capacity, which is a real concern, we do continue to observe strong evidence that the link between infection and serious health harm has weakened considerably. However, it is likely that this is due to immune protection, not least from vaccines, more than it is to Omicron being inherently milder. Uh, that is borne out by current experience in Hong Kong, where relatively low rates of vaccination, particularly in the older population, mean that Omicron is causing very significant levels of severe illness and death there. This, therefore, underlines the continued vital importance of vaccination. So if you haven't yet had doses that you are eligible for, please do get them now. Extension of the programme is ongoing in line with JCVI advice. Letters inviting five to 11 year olds not in higher risk groups uh, for vaccination started arriving at the end of last week and first vaccinations are scheduled for Saturday. Additional booster jags for older adults in care homes started last week and appointments will start next week for everyone aged 75 and over. 
Additional boosters for those who are immunosuppressed will start from mid-April. Uh, I know people who are immunosuppressed and indeed others on the highest risk list are concerned about high case rates at a time when regulations are being eased. It is important to stress, therefore, that very uh, significant protection is provided by vaccination. Presenting officer, the higher transmissibility of Omicron does pose challenges. However, protection from vaccines and also the increasing availability of effective COVID treatments are also important factors. Uh, using the approach set out in our revised strategic framework and based on clinical advice, our assessment is that the virus continues to present a medium threat However, we remain optimistic that it will move from medium to low over spring. As a result, we consider that the overall transition signalled in the strategic framework remains appropriate. We should and will continue the transition away from legal requirements to advice and guidance instead. Therefore, I can confirm firstly that from Friday, and in line with other UK nations, all remaining COVID-related travel restrictions will be lifted. While we do have some concerns about this, UK travel patterns mean that diverging from the rest of the UK would cause economic disadvantage without delivering any meaningful public health benefit. We do, of course, retain the ability to reintroduce measures if, for example, a new variant emerges. Then, secondly, from next Monday, 21st March, with one temporary precautionary exception, the remaining domestic legal measures will be lifted and replaced with appropriate guidance. That means on Monday, the requirement on businesses and service providers to retain customer contact details will end, and so too will the requirement for businesses, places of worship and service providers to have regard to Scottish Government guidance on COVID and to take reasonably practical measures set out in the guidance. The exception relates to the requirement to wear face coverings on public transport and in certain indoor settings. Given the current spike in case numbers, we consider it prudent to retain this requirement in regulation for a further short period. I know this will be disappointing for businesses and service providers such as daycare services. However, ensuring maximum continued use of face coverings will provide some additional protection, particularly for the most vulnerable, at a time when the risk of infection is very high, and it may help us get over this spike more quickly. We will review it again in two weeks before the Easter recess, and our expectation now is that this regulation will convert to guidance in early April. The other issue I want to cover today is testing. Uh, regrettably, our freedom of manoeuvre here is severely limited by the fact that our funding is determined by UK government decisions taken for England. However, we have sought as far as we can to reach the right decisions for Scotland. It is important to note that we are aiming for the same long-term position as England on testing. However, we consider that the transition should be longer. In England, testing for people without symptoms ended in mid-February and will do so at the end of this month for those with symptoms. We intend the transition to last until the end of April. This is as far as we can go within funding constraints, but this does allow us to take account of current case numbers and better support the shift in our management of the virus overall. A paper has been published on the Scottish Government website setting out the detail. However, in summary, for the next month until Easter, there will be no change to our testing advice. If you don't have symptoms, you should continue for now to use a lateral flow test twice weekly daily for seven days if you're a close contact of a positive case and before visiting someone who is vulnerable. If you have symptoms, you should continue to get a PCR test either at a testing site or by post. However, following the Easter weekend from 18th April, we will no longer advise people without symptoms to test twice weekly. With the exception of health and care settings, the advice to test regularly will also end from 18th April for workplaces and for early learning and childcare settings, mainstream and special schools and universities and colleges. However, until the end of April, we will continue to advise using LFTs daily for seven days if a close contact and on each occasion when visiting a hospital or a care home. And until the end of April, we will continue to advise those with symptoms to get a PCR test. Contact tracing of positive cases will also continue until the end of April. PCR test sites will remain open during this period, though opening hours and locations may change during the transition. Siding officer, though, as with all measures, we will keep it under review, our intention is that from the end of April, all routine population-wide testing will end, including for those who have symptoms. Contact tracing will end at this point too, although people with symptoms of respiratory illness will be advised to stay at home. Physical test sites will close at the end of April, although mobile testing units and lab capacity will be retained for our longer-term testing purposes. 
Uh, we will do everything we can to support those who have worked on the testing programme during the transition, and I want to thank all of them for their invaluable contribution over the past two years. Uh, from the 1st of May, in place of population-wide approach, we will use testing on a targeted basis to support clinical care and treatment and protect high-risk settings, and also for surveillance, outbreak management and responding to significant developments such as a new variant. Uh, let me stress, though, that for any purpose for which we do continue to advise testing, access to tests will, in Scotland, remain free of charge. Sitting officer, today does mark steady progress back to normal life and to a more sustainable way of managing this virus. However, while cases are spiking, there is still considerable pressure on the NHS and there is concern amongst uh, the most vulnerable in particular. So I do ask everyone to be patient for a little while longer on face coverings and to continue following all advice on hygiene, ventilation, testing and, of course, vaccination. And let me take the opportunity in concluding to thank everyone again for all their continued efforts. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I start by praising the great British public for their welcoming attitude and compassion? We now know that, as of this afternoon, over 100,000 applications have already been launched to be part of the UK Government's Home for Ukraine initiative. We all agreed in this chamber that more needed to be done in recent days to support those displaced because of this war, uh, and I'm pleased progress is being made. Now is the time for collaboration, and it's encouraging to see that the Scottish Government are positively engaging with the UK Government over their proposals. Turning to the COVID statement, over two years ago, our lives were turned upside down by COVID. The pandemic has had a dramatic effect on all of us. We've all had to make sacrifices. We've all lost loved ones to this virus. We've all changed our way of life. COVID has not gone away, but we have learned to live with it. The UK's world-leading vaccination scheme has been a game-changer, allowing us to move on and get back to, to normality. It's true that case rates are higher at the moment than any of us would like, but COVID cases were always going to rise as restrictions were eased. We can't get complacent but, with COVID, but we have to move forward. We can't stay stuck with COVID rules forever. That's why it will be a blow for households and businesses that the First Minister has decided to keep the face mask rules in place. The government said last month these would be removed on the 21st of March, but now that's been delayed. Why won't the First Minister trust the Scottish public to take the steps they think are right to protect themselves and their families? And why are we back to this wait-and-see approach again with no firm date? to allow businesses and the public to plan ahead. The First Minister said she will report to Parliament again before the Easter recess, but there is no guarantee that a positive announcement will be make, made then. So can the First Minister... So can the First Minister tell us what criteria her government is basing this decision on and what will need to change for this face mask restriction to be removed at the next review? Finally, the First Minister is proposing continuing to provide testing kits for the whole population well into April. This does not come without significant costs. Funding that could be used to support our frontline NHS workers to tackle the backlog in routine treatments. So can the First Minister tell us exactly how much this extension of free testing will cost here in Scotland? First Minister. Firstly, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Scotland is not stuck. Um, let me just remind uh, the Chamber and indeed all of uh, Scotland that as of Monday, every single legal measure to help us uh, control COVID will have been uh, lifted with a limited temporary exception for a continued requirement to wear uh, face coverings. Now, given the spike we're seeing in cases right now and the very high risk of infection, it, this helps us protect each other and in particular during this spike it helps us to protect the most vulnerable in our communities and I think it will help us get this spike under control more quickly than might otherwise be the case. And I think that's very much in the spirit of solidarity and mutual concern for each other uh, that has characterised the public response to this pandemic over the past two years. 
And I think uh, many people in Scotland uh, will actually, in light of very high cases right now, welcome uh, this precautionary move. And even those who may not welcome it, and there will be those I understand in that category, I think will nevertheless be accepting of that and understand the reasons for it. Um, I will update Parliament again in two weeks. That is before the Easter recess. I would hope then, and the expectation that we would convert this regulation uh, to uh, to uh, guidance in the early part of, of April, uh, the 4th of April, of course, being the first uh, Monday, and that would be the expectation. Uh, but I think it's right to, to take uh, this approach. How we will make that decision is set out in the strategic framework uh, that we published three weeks ago. Uh, in short, though, we will want to see this increase in cases stabilised. We will want to see that risk of infection at 1 in 18, according to the ONS, in the most recent week, uh, start to reduce, so that particularly the most vulnerable in our society um, are uh, not at the risk that they are right now. Uh, but let me remind everybody, this will be the only uh, legal measure that remains in place, and it will be in place for a short uh, two-week uh, period of time. Um, on testing, um, I've got news for Douglas Ross that we will have to uh, fund now all of uh, our continued testing requirement, including the more proportionate targeted testing system that will be in place for longer uh, term, because the, the consequentials are, are not uh, continuing. Um, but, uh, and these decisions, of course, are driven uh, by the uh, situation uh, that the UK government arrives at for England. Uh, we will continue to assess the overall uh, cost of testing over uh, the next period. If the Conservatives want to listen uh, to my answer. Colleagues, can I just ask for quiet across the chamber so that we can hear questions and answers? The, overall, the overall cost uh, will depend uh, on factors uh, such as outbreaks. It will depend on whether or not we see any new variants emerging, and we will have to flex that cost based on the reality of the situation. The cost of extending uh, prudently for a period access to LFTs, and unlike uh, the situation south of the border, making sure that where we are advising testing it is free of charge for people who need to test, uh, will be a relatively small part of that overall annual cost. Uh, and we will continue to judge that cost based on the circumstances that prevail with the pandemic at any given time. Jackie Bailey. The number of COVID cases is rising. Hospitalisations are at their highest point since February 2021. Health boards are raising concerns about capacity. And I understand that the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital was very close to declaring a code black last Thursday. All three NHS Lanarkshire hospitals are reportedly overwhelmed and staff absence is up. Can the First Minister give the Chamber more information about testing for health and social care workers after May particularly in terms of frequency and staff groups that will be targeted. Key to our ability to return to normal, of course, is the use of antiviral medication, and I am pleased that testing remains for those who are immunosuppressed. But there are reports that antivirals are not being administered currently in the five-day window for them to be effective, and some eligible patients are not being offered antivirals at all. One contacted their GP, but the GP had no supplies, no ability to prescribe. The five days passed without her receiving the antiviral medication that would have lessened the impact of COVID on someone with a serious underlying health condition. Providing assurance to those with underlying health conditions becomes all the more important as restrictions are lifted. So can the First Minister advise what action is being taken to improve the administration of antiviral medication so that everyone is protected? How much is currently being administered in Scotland? Whether there are sufficient supplies? And finally, whether it will now be done by GPs? First Minister. Uh, firstly, it, would, uh, it is our intention that uh, health and care workers will uh, be advised to continue testing uh, after the end of April. That is likely uh, to uh, at least initially be on a twice-weekly basis, although that will be kept under uh, regular clinical review. But as I said in my statement, one of the purposes for testing after the end of April will be protection of high-risk settings, and that will include, of course, uh, hospitals and uh, care homes. Um, in terms of antivirals, uh, the NHS is working hard to ensure that those who are eligible for antiviral treatment uh, get access to that. I can't comment on individual cases, but if detail is sent to me, I'm happy to have that 
uh, looked at. The, eligibility, the availability of antiviral treatment is continuing to develop and increase, and therefore the eligibility of people to uh, be treated uh, with antivirals will also increase. And again, that will be kept under uh, very close review. The five-day window is important. Uh, obviously, that is why we have been continuing to uh, support testing, and it is why we will continue to support testing uh, to help with access to care and treatment. And principally, that will be to ensure that firm diagnosis can be given for those uh, who may be eligible for antiviral treatment. But that is not going to be a fixed group of people uh, as time passes. It will be an increasing group of people as availability and effectiveness of these treatments uh, continue to increase. And we will continue to ensure uh, that the health service is working in a way uh, that best supports as that develops uh, the quickest and most effective access to those treatments and uh, the Health Secretary I'm sure would be happy to provide more information as uh, access to this scheme and the scope uh, of this scheme widens in the weeks and months to come. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. It will be disheartening to many Scots that despite the extra sacrifices we've made in Scotland, our infection rates are still so stubbornly high. Uh, the uh, presiding officer, the First Minister rightly mentioned the plight of Ukrainian refugees, and I echo my party's support for her government's efforts in that regard. And I'd like to ask about them in particular as regards to COVID, because before the invasion, uh, vaccine rollout in Ukraine had only reached 35% of adults. They will be coming to a country with one of the highest infection rates in the whole of Europe. After everything they've been through, the last thing they need is a bad dose of COVID. And so to that end, can I ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to offer arriving refugees access to immediate vaccination for any refugees wishing to take that up? First Minister. Uh, I, as I indicated earlier on, I will set out more details in a statement tomorrow uh, of the arrangements that we are working to put in place uh, to welcome and support uh, refugees to come here from Ukraine. I, I can say now, though, that includes intensive work with Public Health Scotland uh, to look at exactly uh, what we should uh, offer, both in terms of testing uh, when people arrive and also vaccination of people that are not uh, already vaccinated. So that work is underway as part of the, the wider preparations to welcome people here, and I'll set out more detail of all of that tomorrow. Annabel Ewing, to be followed by Sandesh Gulhani. Presiding officer, two years out, give or take a week, uh, from the first lockdown of 23rd March 2020, thoughts inevitably turn to reflection on what we have all been through and to the heroic efforts of our NHS staff in getting us to this point. But we also look to the months ahead, including the potential for a further winter in the shadow of COVID. Is the First Minister therefore yet in a position to advise as to when a second COVID booster vaccination will be available to the population as a whole? First Minister. Um, that's an important question. Uh, I am not able to give uh, that information right now because, of course, we are dependent on JCVI advice and we follow JCVI advice. So the advice that we have is what I have set out progress on in my statement today. Uh, additional boosters for certain groups of the population where that has been recommended and, of course, vaccination uh, for all 5 to 11-year-olds or the offer of vaccination for all 5 to 11-year-olds. And I would encourage everybody in these groups to take up uh, these offers as soon as they are available. Uh, we await further JCVI advice on what uh, may be required as we go into next winter. My expectation and certainly the planning assumption of the Scottish Government is that this will be a regular uh, vaccination programme, but exactly what the frequency of that will be, uh, who exactly it will be targeted to and how many doses may be involved uh, still awaits uh, final advice from the JCVI. And of course, we'll keep Parliament updated on that as soon as that advice becomes available. Sandesh Gilhani to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Shamefully, the SNP Green Government are still dragging their feet on establishing a network of long COVID clinics across Scotland. Up to 90 clinics are up and running across England, including the Hertfordshire Clinic that I discussed with the Cabinet Secretary for Health as an exemplar model. Thousands of patients are suffering here in Scotland with long COVID. When will the First Minister finally listen, ask her Health Secretary to deliver solutions and not just announce money? First Minister. Um, that is uh, not the case. We have uh, published an action plan. Uh, we have devoted resources rightly to that action plan. There are a number of actions within it that health boards are taking forward. Uh, clinics uh, are a part of that, but not the only part. What health boards have to ensure is that they have uh, support services in place 
uh, holistically uh, for people suffering from long COVID. Uh, and that they are provided as far as possible from uh, routine uh, health care up to and including uh, specialist health care. Um, and that work is underway. And that work will need to continue alongside, of course, ongoing uh, efforts to make sure that we continue to understand the causes of and the impacts of long COVID uh, on the health of individuals. Uh, that's all set out in the action plan and will continue to be updated as appropriate. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, President also The Guardian recently reported that the UK Government is to end funding for free COVID testing in English special schools and children's care homes this month, a move greeted by sources in the UK Health Security Agency with an I quote shock and disgust. What assurances can the First Minister give that the Scottish Government's approach to testing will continue to be guided first and foremost by public health expertise and not by political pressure? First Minister. Uh, I have set out uh, the constraints that we operate within uh, in terms of funding, but within that, of, of course, we seek to take these decisions based on uh, public health advice and considerations. I have set out our approach to testing, ensuring that as we transition uh, to the end state, steady state, hopefully testing approach, uh, we do that in a careful way and with an appropriate transition. Um, I have set out the timescales in terms of ending uh, routine uh, testing with lateral flow devices in the population generally and within education settings. Uh, but what I've also said is that for any uh, purpose for which the government continues to advise testing, and I've set out the broad categories of that right now, but that may change over time depending on development of the pandemic. But in any, uh, pur for any purpose for which uh, the government is recommending testing, we will ensure that access to tests, whether they are uh, LFD devices or uh, PCR tests, that they remain free of charge for those who are advised to use them. Monica Lennon to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It has been more than 140 days since NHS Lanarkshire hit the panic button and declared a code black. None of us want this to be the new normal for NHS patients and workers. Can the First Minister reassure my constituents and people across Scotland that the Test and Protect transition plan will not make achieving NHS recovery any harder? And can she indicate when NHS Lanarkshire is expected to de escalate from code black? First Minister. At the point of uh, having a, a lengthier transition plan uh, than uh, we're seeing uh, south of the border is to ensure uh, that uh, we migrate smoothly and effectively to the end state. Now, you know, there, as we've seen in, in recent times, this pandemic is going to continue uh, to throw up challenges for us, but it is intended to ensure uh, a smooth transition. Uh, and I think the timeline that we set out uh, is one uh, that allows us to do that. In terms of wider pressures in the NHS, including in NHS Lanarkshire, but these are being experienced in many other health boards, uh, we need to see hospital cases come down again. We are just under 2,000 uh, patients as of today today in hospital uh, with COVID. They will not all be in hospital because of COVID, uh, but they are in hospital uh, with COVID, and, and that brings additional challenges. So part of the reason for being uh, slightly cautious on face coverings today is hopefully to help us get that spike under control as we get uh, the spike in cases driven by this sublineage of Omicron under control. We will start to see hospital cases come down again, and that will then allow NHS Lanarkshire uh, and other health boards to get back on track in restoring services uh, to normal. So I hope we will see that happen uh, very soon. Um, but uh, the steps that we've set out today are intended to help uh, support that process um, and have that process happen as quickly as possible. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Presiding officer, many people in the communities that we represent will be worried about rising cases. I saw the Chief Medical Officer mention vaccine effectiveness studies at the weekend. Can I ask the First Minister about these? What reassurance they can provide to the vaccinated and perhaps encouragement to those who are yet to get their jags? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously, uh, this is something that clinical experts uh, keep under uh, very close review. Uh, the data on vaccine effectiveness is scrutinised uh, closely. Emerging evidence demonstrates that uh, boosters do continue to provide very strong protection against serious illness. Uh, recently published Health Security Agency data indicates that initial vaccine effectiveness against hospitalisation of older people increases to around 90 per cent two weeks after a booster uh, and remains at around that level for over 10 weeks, although there will obviously continue to be strong protection uh, after that. Uh, that is why we continue to encourage people to come forward for vaccination, even if they have not had boosters uh, so far, it is not too late to do so. It does give uh, significant protection. I mentioned Hong Kong 
in my statement, and it's worth uh, people who are interested going uh, to look at that, because Omicron there is causing uh, very severe illness and uh, spiralling death numbers because vaccination rates uh, are relatively low. That does underline the importance of vaccination and the fact that it is immune protection uh, making Omicron less severe rather than any inherent uh, mildness of the variant. Julian Mackay to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This will be a worrying time for people who were previously shielding, who are still being cautious and reducing the transition away from routine asymptomatic and then symptomatic testing will make it much harder for them to avoid coming into contact with people who are COVID positive. Will the Scottish Government consider continuing access to testing for families and carers of people who are clinically extremely vulnerable and what other mitigations will be put in place to ensure vulnerable people continue to be protected from COVID? First Minister. Well, we set out our intended approach to testing after uh, the end of April in the paper uh, that we've published today, and I've set out the summary of that in my statement. Uh, many people, of course, who are extremely clinical vulnerable, not everybody, but many of them, uh, will be in the categories of people who may benefit from antiviral treatment if they get uh, COVID. Therefore, they will be amongst people that are still advised to test even after uh, the end of April. And of course, that group of people will remain un under review as treatments develop and become more available. I, I do uh, recognise that this is an anxious time for, for people as we make this, this transition uh, back to normal, but do so with appropriate caution uh, with uh, those that are most vulnerable, uh, particularly in mind. And we've tried to do that at every step, and we will uh, try to continue to do that at every step yet to come. John Mason to be followed by Tess White. Uh, I think many people, including myself, will be very concerned that we now have 1,996 people in hospital with COVID. And some of these people might be thinking we should really be increasing measures and restrictions rather than reducing them. H how would the First Minister respond to such comments? First Minister. Um, I, I do not uh, take that view. If I did take that view, my, the contents of my statement would have been different uh, today. I think we are on uh, a justified journey back to normality because thanks mainly to vaccines but also to natural immunity we have seen a considerable weakening uh, between uh, in the link between cases and severe illness um, if we didn't have vaccines or uh, some natural immunity uh, we'd be in a very different position and i think we would uh, find uh, the need to have additional protections to avoid people becoming seriously ill and dying thankfully that's not the position we are in uh, so we can uh, migrate back to normality uh, with a different approach to managing this virus. But it's important we do so with appropriate care and caution, which we've done at every stage, particularly uh, when this BA2 spike uh, is causing the challenges it is. So we'll continue uh, to do this carefully and cautiously, but uh, I think it is in everybody's interest, given the wider harms of COVID restrictions, uh, that we do get back to normality or continue to get back to normality as soon as we possibly can. Tess White to be followed by Siobhan Brown. First Minister. It's emerged that the vaccine passport schemes cost the taxpayer almost £7 million. That's more than 10 times the originally projected cost of £600,000. Can the First Minister account for how costs were allowed to balloon like this? And does the Scottish Government believe that this represents value for money for the taxpayer? First Minister. Um, yeah, I do think the decisions that we have taken uh, to try to avoid uh, COVID cases being even higher, the harm caused by COVID to be even greater than it has been, uh, will uh, show in time to have been uh, worth that. Obviously, we are about to have a public inquiry that will look at all of these issues um, and hold governments uh, here uh, to account, and that is right and proper. Uh, but every time uh, somebody says that we shouldn't have taken a particular step, in this case, vaccine passports and avoided the cost of vaccine passports also has to consider uh, what the implications of that would have been in terms of uh, higher cases potentially, in terms of more people in hospital potentially and in terms of, of more people perhaps becoming seriously unwell. All of that has a cost as well and that is not just a financial cost. Thank you. Before I go on to the next question, can I just remind colleagues that we do treat one another with courtesy and respect at all times in the Chamber? And I call Siobhan Brown to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the First Minister if she agrees with the evidence given by Public Health Scotland to the COVID-19 Recovery Committee that the economy is an important determinant of health 
and that the cuts to universal credit and other austerity policies have a profoundly negative impact on public health? First Minister. Yes, I agree strongly with that, and I think that is borne out by evidence. There will be many people across Scotland and indeed the UK right now who are suffering public health uh, adverse implications uh, because of the poverty that the removal of the universal credit uplift has plunged them into. We will see, unfortunately, uh, these effects exacerbated by uh, inflationary pressures and the increasing cost of living. Uh, so, as well as uh, restoring that universal credit uplift, I would call on the UK Government and the Chancellor when he makes his spring statement next week uh, to deliver significant support for people uh, living in poverty right now, uh, because that will help their health uh, as well as ensure that their quality of life is better as well. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At the most recent meeting of the cross-party group on learning disability, access to vaccination was once again raised by people who have a learning disability and their family carers. Will the First Minister ensure that people who have a learning disability and can be more vulnerable are called for the, uh, the Spring Booster Programme? And will she ensure that where reasonable adjustments are required, such as for people who have autism and find large vac vaccination sites difficult to be in, that such adjustments will be made? First Minister. Um, the, the groups who will be called for the additional booster, of course, are, are determined in the advice of the JCVI, and we follow uh, that advice. Um, I think the points about accessibility and ensuring that those with uh, particular conditions, autism, are properly catered for is, is a point well made. Uh, given the, the stage we are at currently um, in the vaccination programme, there is less reliance on big, large-scale uh, vaccination centres uh, and uh, much more on, on smaller uh, scale settings. Uh, we have tried all along to balance the need for uh, speed and large-scale uh, approaches to vaccination uh, with accessibility, and that will continue. Um, and I think our vaccination rates, uh, although there are still people who could come forward for vaccination and we encourage them to do so, I think our high vaccination rates uh, speak for the success of that approach. But these are important issues which we will continue to bear in mind. And Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Scottish Court Service told the Justice Committee uh, that the removal of one metre physical distancing will allow juries to get back into the courtroom and help tackle uh, the huge backlog of cases. Given that there are around 43,000 cases in that backlog, First of all, can the First Minister confirm that that physical restriction will be also be removed on Monday along with others? But secondly, that if it is removed, uh, are courts now able to move to other business-as-usual operations, which will both increase the capacity of our courtrooms and the volume of cases, which you can now hear as well? First Minister. Well, it is for the court service to uh, manage the business. Of course, we have uh, provided additional funding to help with recovery, including uh, an increase in the uh, routine uh, resource budget for the court's service. All uh, legal restrictions uh, with the short-term uh, temporary exception of the face covering requirement will be lifted uh, as of uh, Monday. Many of them are already uh, lifted. The remaining ones will be lifted as of Monday and we will continue to work with the court service, as we will with other parts of the public sector, uh, to get services back to normal and to catch up on backlogs as quickly as possible. Thank you. That concludes the First Minister's statement COVID-19 update. We'll move on to the next item of business now. And that is a statement by Marie Goujon on developing a catching policy to deliver sustainable fisheries management in Scotland. I'll allow a moment or two for people to, to get into place. <laughs> 